Welcome, everyone, to the latest installment of basic toolmaking. I've been doing this for a couple of years now at different conferences. It, there was one on performance, there was one on running unattended, there was one on handling dependencies, all this sort of stuff. And uh, I, found, I found that a very nice format, so glad to be able to present it here at the summit. And today we will be talking about extensibility of tools that you make every day, I think, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here. Um, great shout out to all the sponsors who make this fine conference and also, also other events uh, I've been to possible. Without them, we were, wouldn't be able to, to hold any of these. Who's the guy in the front? Name's Evgeny, I come from Berlin, and if you look at my Twitter handle and my, uh, my blog uh, URL, I can't ever move away without a complete personal rebranding, so uh, I'm going to be staying in Berlin for the foreseeable. Um, I've been breaking and fixing computer for computers for over 30 years. Big part of that was making tools for people, coming to think of it, first tool I ever made that got into the hands of co-workers and co-students at that time was in the early 90s, uh, written in Rex to like automate and support Fortran programming processes on IBM 360. So uh, since then it was Bash and CMD Shell and Kix and BBS and all, all this sort of stuff until PowerShell came along and then it was Bash and all these other thing, things plus PowerShell. Microsoft MVP for four years. Um, I've spoken at several events before. My home conference is the PSConf EU, uh, unsurprisingly, where I've been to every one of them, not necessarily as a speaker every time. Um, other events. What's this about today? The whole plan here is to prevent you as toolmakers from becoming a victim of your own success. So this is a, a reenactment of one of the first Darwin Awards ever given, right? That's that infamous uh, Chevy Impala with a jetpack strapped to the, to the uh, bed. Um, great planning, great execution, uh, great engineering guys, uh, still dead. <laughs> <clears throat> So this, this should not be happening to you if you write a PowerShell uh, script or module. And there is a people aspect to it. There is a technology to, uh, aspect to it. So we will be talking about both people and technology in this session. And both exist on both sides uh, of the equation. There is you making the tool. There is your team probably giving the tool to other people outside your organization, if that is meant that way. And this is the poor sword running the tool. Same goes for technology. There are environments where your tools might be run, where you have no control and no knowledge about what's happening there. And there is, of course, your technology stack that you are using to produce the tool, to debug the tool, to optimize the tool, and to extend the tool. But let's start with a story. The story goes like this every time. It's every single time. I've been down this road countless times, shot myself in the foot, got near uh, close to, to a burnout, get out of that, rinse and repeat. So you made a tool, and the tool does one thing. It apparently does this thing very well because the tool starts getting traction. People start using it, and how do you know that people start using it? They start giving you feature requests. Hey, that was, that was a great script that I got from Bob. I, I heard you wrote that, right? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. Yeah, I appreciate you using it. Yeah, but if that could just make that one thing. What's the PowerShell's default answer to this? Hold my beer. Right? <laughs> so over time, the tool that was initially meant to do one thing becomes a toolbox. 
There are problems with this already, but this is, this is manageable as a rule. And then, if, you do, if you're not careful, it will spiral out of control and you end up maintaining a monster, which at some point even may become unmaintainable and then you're up for, for a refactor or you abandon the tool and run or whatever your strategy is to cope with it. <clears throat> so this is one dimension, functionality. But there is more to that. Functionality is just one of the three dimensions uh, of extensibility. Now, let's say you made a script that produces a really, really useful report out of some SQL database that your organization has. And this has been running for a while, and then that other department appears to have that same sort of data, but in a Postgres database. And they come to you and say, hey, we saw that nifty report that the guys who run SQL have. Could we get that too? A different target. Same functionality, different target. And then there is that uh, third uh, department who run Oracle and uh, so on and so forth. And then <clears throat> you end up knowing more about databases than the guys uh, who actually run them. <laughs> Second dimension, functionality, targets. But we have 2024, which means to do everything on every target, we have more than one method, protocol for connecting, method, method of accept, uh, accessing, method of authenticating to do this job. So say you have a script that does, I don't know, systems inventory, and you started out doing it by PowerShell remoting because that's our default as PowerShell, right? And then the script goes outside of your organization, and then there are those people who disable remoting in their uh, environments. And in my experience, I work for Sampras. We do Active Directory security, software tools for Active Directory security. And in my experience so far, those same people who disable PowerShell remoting usually leave remote WMI running. So to do the same thing, you could just fall back to remote WMI, but it's, it's a completely different uh, development paradigm. It's a completely different authentication paradigm, right? And then maybe you have uh, targets that accept even more methods. You end up doing SSH. You end up doing, <clears throat> I don't know, some proprietary technology. So functionality, target, and uh, method or protocol. Three dimensions to this uh, tool building extensibility that you will probably be confronted with as you go along. Sounds complicated? That's because it is. How do we deal with it without inching closer to burnout every time we look at that code? There are two answers to that. The obvious one and what is really happening. The obvious answer was given five, six years ago by a DevOps, um, DevOps engineer from Germany named Frank Sons. I had it on a t-shirt actually, <clears throat> but that washed out and uh, I, I didn't manage to make a new one for this talk. Yeah, you can plan everything out. You can do proper architecture, you can spend hours at the whiteboard. You don't have to implement ev everything from the start, but good planning would prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot going forward. Unfortunately, that doesn't work that way in practical tool making, because in practical tool making, we are, I would like to um, call it loosely managed chaos. Other people call it agile, but it amounts to the same thing. So not what got us to Mars, right? The, the opposite of what got us to the moon. <laughs> First thing you need to be aware of when starting 
to put your tools into other people's hands. You are a maintainer now, whether you want or not, whether you like it or not. You are maintaining to other people's use. So your first order of business will always be providing the functionality you promised uh, your customers. But there is more to it. You have to be ahead of all the environmental changes that could influence your tool. Let me show you a small example here. It's just one, one uh, line of script. What we are doing here, we're checking against Active Directory whether the uh, forest functional level is uh, higher than uh, 2012. So 2012 R2 and upwards in AD is more than because uh, there are all those nifty Kerberos extensions and so on, and um, <clears throat> everything below that is ancient. Anybody sees a problem with this thing? No? This is found in hundreds, if not thousands, scripts and modules out there that do stuff with Active Directory, like inventory sort of stuff, or prerequisite check, checking for some product. And this thing will start failing come next year. Nothing, nothing as complicated. Server 2025 introduced a new functional level and this functional level stored numerically in AD is 10. And the system directory services directory entry class that is being decorated here returns all the properties that are not of some arcane binary type as string. So we're looking at a string comparison here and we know how that works in PowerShell. We also know how to fix that in PowerShell. You just have to flip the comparison around, right? But it's, it's not being done. It's not being done in PowerShell scripts. It's, it's not being done in uh, scripts supporting commercial products. So we will see some of them failing as people start upgrading their domain controllers and upping the forest for functional level. But this is where you have to be ahead of the game because you assumed responsibility. It's like the fox in the little prince. You tamed me, you are now responsible. That is your tool. Collect feedback. If it's within your organization, it's easy. Set up a, I don't know, Microsoft Forms form or something, or a Teams poll, or just go and talk to people. If the tool that you made is for external audience, then it might not be as easy. You may want to have champions, like some pre-sales engineers like myself, that who will take your tools and give it to the customer, and then maybe you can persuade these people to collect feedback for you. Support where and when needed, because you will get calls not asking for new features, but asking for making the existing features work. And as these development progresses along these three dimensions that I showed, you absolutely should look into finding collaboration because your mental health, your spiritual well-being as a toolmaker, it matters. It empowers you to do what you do and people are thankful. Get them to help. Even if it's just writing documentation, then you don't have to do that. You have time to re recharge or you have time to extend your script. There is one crucial moment in the life cycle of every tool. And this is the most crucial one. Before it sees the light of day outside of your garage. As long as you're at your workstation, hashing out all the aspects of your tool, you're golden. You can do whatever you like with the code. As soon as the first person outside of your immediate bubble gets to use it, you are in the usability space and nothing breaks usability like breaking changes. So you should be planning ahead at least so far as to avoid breaking changes with the very first extension that you do. 
It begins with packaging and shipping. We are at a PowerShell conference. How do you package PowerShell code? We're not talking about workflows and uh, DSC resources, okay? Uh, so, it, declarative thing, or yeah, <clears throat> functional thing, can be packaged in three ways that I know of. If you, if you know something else, um, go ahead and suggest. You could provide a module, you could provide a script, or you could provide a suite of scripts doing several aspects of the same thing packaged as one tool. And there are problems, or let's say advantages and disadvantages to every one of them. Module is, of course, in terms of extensibility, the absolutely best that you as a provider of that module can have, because you can add methods, you can have add types at, um, at your convenience, you can extend it without breaking the overarching architecture, but a module has to be installed or at least loaded into the session. And depending on who the target audience is, it can be made out, uh, out of people who don't know how to do that. So you don't just give them two files, PSD1 and PSM ones. You must give them at least one third file, the README, which they will not read. And uh, yeah, I mean, whom, whom are we kidding? A script is very good, a very good fit to doing one thing, maybe against different targets, maybe using different protocols, but as functionality goes, a script is a very good candidate for one function. As soon as you start extending the functionality, a script becomes a less and less good fit. And well, a suite, a suite of scripts will always have to be named consistently and packaged in some way that makes sense for the target audience because giving people a tool is communication and as we know, communication is measured at the recipient end. Package naming. Goethe says, names are but sound and smoke. Namen sind Schall und Rauch. This is not true for PowerShell packages. Let's look at a couple of examples I, I prepared. Uh, I have to run this to change the working directory. Um, we have a script here. The script is called inventory this machine WMI. So you probably have a pretty good understanding of what the script is going to do, but it takes an array of computer names which sort of contradicts this, this machine close, but even after I put that in, it goes further. I have a protocol parameter that will accept WMI, but it will also accept two further protocols. So this is bad naming. This is bad usability. This is usability fallen victim to extensibility. Report database usage. Cool thing. I can even run it. It's, it's, it's not just bullshit code. It is bullshit code. It is bullshit, it absolutely is bullshit code, but it will produce results. Table usage report, there is no such database, it's just write host. <laughs> <clears throat> but what I wanted to show is what happens if you, if you press dash. So all of a sudden, this report database, which should be quite innocuous, allows you to optimize this database, so, so, so potentially change data in it, right? And I, I can just uh, let it rip. It optimized the database, but it will also allow you to drop the set database, which is not what report database usage is supposed to be doing, right? Same thing with modules. Um, I've got a module here, inventory of the world. It's also bullshit code just for the, uh, for, for the demonstration here. But if we look at the commands, it allows us to create a user, 
to restart a machine. So nothing to do with inventory. It started with inventory. It, start, it probably started with invoke inventory in that module, but then people came asking for more functionality and this completely broke the naming. Think about it. Naming is important. Who of you was uh, uh, in the session on Monday by James Brundage, uh, module making? Yeah, modules are brands and rebranding is expensive. So that's what I basically wanted to uh, convey here. Modules should not include specifics in their name because specifics can be absolutely provided in the names of uh, and arguments of commandlets that the modules export. Again, James spoke about a module called Gumshoe and everybody knew what, what, that, uh, uh, what a, that was about. Scripts. Scripts could include actions in the names. This is actually quite helpful, but the other two dimensions should not be part of the name of the script. So, <clears throat> now let's look at the universal flowchart of all computing. Input, data processing, output. <laughs> I will not be talking about the part in the middle because that is up to you as tool makers. Whatever your tool does in the middle where nobody is looking because the user is waiting for, for the script to complete or for the function to complete, it's up to you. But input and output are both fields where extensibility will clash with usability if you do not plan accordingly. Let's look at the input uh, part. And this is one of the hills I'm prepared to die, uh, die on. Every script, every item that is executed by an end user, by an unprepared end user who did not read the fucking manual, uh, must provide some behavior other than throwing an error, obviously, when run without any parameters whatsoever. And a hint how the script can or should be run. It's an absolutely legitimate part of this output. Because people will run that without parameter because they do not read the manual. Let's look at some code here. A simple script, it does something, and it does something to a remote system to which it can uh, connects either by using a computer name or by using an IP address. Simple. Both are mandatory parameters, each in uh, each own parameter set. So if you run, if I run it without parameters, I get exactly what I wanted to avoid. I get an error. Jeffrey Snow used to set his error uh, coloring for, to, to green because he always said that uh, red color is bad for blood pressure and so on. But <clears throat> uh, this is what, in my opinion, should not happen with a tool. You can avoid that. This is the, this, the very same script. But here we specified a default parameter set that is not part of the uh, parameter block. It's absolutely okay to do so. So in this case, when a, a PowerShell cannot resolve the parameter set name from the parameters, it will use this. And the user gets nice output telling him or her that uh, he or she has to specify something. And then, of course, there are users who will not run your script, especially if it's a script, who will not open up PowerShell and then run the script from there. At least on Windows, there is this nifty capability of right-clicking, and now I apologize that my stuff is German. Uh, there is this run with PowerShell. What happens? It runs and it disappears. So to accommodate for that, you should be providing some guidance uh, or some, some uh, checking as to whether it's uh, been run this way or not. And I do have an example here. Uh, it should be the um, 102, run with PowerShell, and it just 
pops up on the screen. There are different approaches uh, to how to do that. My go-to is I look at script line number and uh, offset line. Those are usually not zero if it's run from a shell, and they are zero if it's run from the right click, but the additional check that you have to do, at least on Windows, is whether it's in the ISE, because the ISE will also provide this, uh, these numbers. So three lines of code, and um, you have caught this uh, usage uh, scenario as well. Parameter sets. Parameter sets may take you up, uh, down a rabbit hole of dynamic parameters. Whoever was in YAP session on Monday morning uh, saw some really, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan of dynamic parameters because let's look at some, uh, some usability here, some user experience and uh, project extensibility onto that. So, so this is a script uh, or a function exported by a script and this function does something to, um, to uh, nope, this was actually this one, does something to um, machines. You can provide a computer name and a credential, which will hold for every parameter set, but then, if you are analyzing this machine as a file server, then there is a parameter that you could specify uh, as um, the folder depth. And uh, for that, there are some restrictions as how deep you might go. For uh, examining this machine as Active Directory, there are other, uh, other uh, parameters that you could specify and so on and so forth. But let's look at how it looks uh, if, for instance, exported uh, from a module. Explore system, and then I see all these parameters. These are three, six, nine, uh, nine parameters already, and I only need one use case. And if I select the wrong parameter, then I'm in the wrong parameter set, and then parameters uh, that, uh, that are actually expected to fill out and assign values to will disappear, and this is not good. Uh, this, this produces tickets. And uh, tickets are good in commercial software because you have support teams to, to process them. Tickets um, are not good in PowerShell tool making because uh, it will usually end up being frustration and phone calls uh, after hours and so on and so forth. So not, and, and now imagine I would start adding functionality on top of this. So this, this, uh, these parameters would grow even further and the user would get overwhelmed and the menu in IntelliSense would not provide them all and so on and so forth. This is where dynamic parameters are gold. I will show you this. The very same function, explore system. And then I just have the three parameters, uh, computer name, obviously, because I'm talking to a remote system, credential, and target system, where I can select what kind of target system I, uh, I intend to be talking to. And if I select Linux, then there is just the trust host key parameter that was intended for Linux. And if I add 20, more potential targets, then only, only the uh, parameters valid for that specific target will pop up here in, Intelli in IntelliSense. There is a gotcha to this. At least I wasn't able to get that to work. Of course, one machine, it can't be Linux and AD, but it, for instance, it could be a domain controller, a SQL server, and a file server, even if that's not recommended. Um, I could, of course, make this parameter an array. And in this case, dynamic parameters will get generated and they will get enforced if you attach validators to them, but they will not be fed back to IntelliSense. So the UX will be broken. The methodology remains, but the UX uh, will be broken. Windows GUI, if you're into it, not very good for extensibility in my opinion and experience, 
but I'm uh, the one who always says Windows GUI in scripts is an abomination. A good compromise is poly web, but then you have to, to think about shipping because it's a separate module. If, you, if you're good with shipping modules out to your target audience, then Podi Web is a great thing. With 20 lines of PowerShell, you can create an amazing dashboard providing all the input capabilities that you expect. But again, you have, uh, I see a typo in there, uh, you have to ship it somehow. Text UI. Jeffrey Hicks uh, did a talk last year at the PSConf EU about like, simulating Norton Commander in, in, in PowerShell. This could be an approach that you can absolutely take to providing a default behavior at least. Some interactivity for the case where the user uh, invokes your script or a function without any parameters. Output has two uh, aspects to it, what they get and what they see. What the, they get, uh, the, the tool that you made um, is made to do something, so it will either change, change something in the environment if that's the intended usage of the tool, or it will produce some report, uh, export it as a file or something along these lines. And the, the other thing is what they see, the, uh, the output to the console, to the screen, or to the speech processor or whatever. Output files. If your script or module provides output files, do not change the default location, even if it wasn't the best choice in the beginning. Leave them as they are. If, they, if your script has gotten any traction, that's where the people will expect to find them. Because in my experience, you can provide output path parameters all you like. If there is a default behavior to that, that is what is uh, what will end up being used. Don't change the de yeah. Abel Wang sa says don't accept the defaults, but in our case, don't change the defaults once they made it out of the door. Log files, same thing. Keep the location constant. Keep the naming convention constant. The naming of log files can be a function dependent. If your module does several things that are not related to each other, multiple functions against the same target, it's okay to provide several logs, differently named logs for them. You need to think about restarting the logging, of course. But yeah, and it's a very good, once your tool starts getting ex extended, it's a very good idea to uh, provide the information about the function target and protocol being used somewhere in the log, either at the beginning of, of the invocation, which would be okay in most cases, or even in each line as a prefix. Output that they see. Keep your initial output, the one your version 001 made it out of the garage, Keep it at least as an option because since you provided that sort of output, you probably thought it would be a good idea to make it that way. And one of your users probably thought that as well. So they will want to keep it. Use write progress if you're doing, uh, doing um, console output. Write progress sucks performance-wise on Windows PowerShell, no doubt about it. Uh, but Still, do use it. You, you don't have to, 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 to log each iteration and write, uh, write uh, progress. It could be a, a one in a hundred or something, but do use it so that the user is not uh, uh, frustrated by having to wait too long without anything happening. Again, if you're into Windows forms or Windows GUIs of any kind, yeah, they are usually not very extensible uh, as functionality goes. They can be make, made to work as output facility. PodiWeb, can't recommend it enough, both for input and output. Great project if you figure out how to ship it. What I found a very, very good way to provide both rich output and uh, good extensibility and good user experience as well is HTML reports. Not like, uh, not 
looking like they were made in the 70s. They should be pretty. They should be interactive with some JavaScript embedded into them. But people will gladly take an HTML report that is rich enough, take it to their work machine, not on the server. Even, they, they might even not have a browser on their server where the script has run. But taking an HTML report to their machine and then digging through it, that is very good UX. And it's very simple to incorporate new functions, new protocols, and all the new stuff that you extend your script with uh, into that. Then there are things that your users will not see. This is basically the part in the middle with the hen. They still need to be done right to support extensibility. And the first thing I would like to talk about is having dependencies. Dependencies could be like running um, as administrator, presence of certain modules, certain operating system type and version, certain installed software, what, whatever your script depends on for running without failure, those are dependencies. And if your script indeed ha has such dependencies, enforce them. And by enforcing, I don't mean that you should start installing features uh, on your production servers without asking the user. But break out of your scripts uh, if they're not there and provide a meaningful error message. Do not, do not rely on the user reading the log. Provide a meaning, meaningful error message that they will usually read. The logs they usually will send to you if you're lucky. The requires close is a very good addition to PowerShell. It's a very, very early breakout. The script uh, or module will not get executed at all, but it also goes so far because <clears throat> Especially if your module does, uh, or script does several things. Some of them require running uh, as administrator, some of them don't. So if you put requires run as administrator uh, uh, at the beginning of the script, you're forcing everyone to run this thing as administrator. As a security consultant of uh, 20 years, I can't support that behavior. Um, same thing about PowerShell versions and so on, um, pro required modules. Yes, they may be required for, uh, for some functionality. They may not be required for, for other functionality. A combination of early breakout and late enforcement can go a very, very long way towards uh, good extensibility. What, what I mean by that is Check the prerequisites that every function will need very early and break out if one of them is not uh, present on the system. This is okay. If you, uh, if, if you already uh, made a connection to database or uh, maybe started a log file that will not have any meaningful information in, uh, in it if you early break out, then, uh, clean up after yourself, and then break out of the script before starting any, any meaningful uh, activity. Late enforcement is the, uh, the opposite of that. Load modules, look at uh, prerequisites the moment a certain function gets started. This, uh, for instance, if you, uh, if, you do, if, you, if you do virtual machine, if your tool does virtual machine management, and you provide uh, this functionality for Hyper-V, then the next suggestion from your user base will probably be to do that same thing for VMware, Proxmox, Xen Server, and uh, all these other uh, sorts of hypervisors. And you can absolutely do that, but you shouldn't check for VMware Power CLI as a global prerequisites for running your script, because those doing Hyper-V, they don't need that. Think about it. Functions. Break up your functionality. Break up your functionality into functions. It could, it could uh, give you a performance hit if you're not uh, careful. But still, break 
atomic, make atomic functions, master functions. Let me show you what I mean by that. Functions. For example, the fun uh, my, my module or my script uh, provides a function named invoke company inventory. And this, uh, uh, I'm in not enforcing anything here. Uh, this can be, the target can be a Windows or a database. The protocol uh, could be one of this. And uh, then, of course, you, ha you have to specify some name and some credential. So this is a master function. But do not implement all these, all these forks in the road within one function, because there are two ways it can go. You either do massive script blocks that are distinct from each other anyway, and then just put them into separate functions. And that makes the logic of your master function very, very transparent for everybody looking at it for the first time. Name the functions accordingly. I tried to sort of do it here. Invoke Windows Inventory WMI. And this function only does Windows inventory using WMI. And then you can use, uh, use the combination of, uh, of the parameters here to, uh, to invoke the correct function uh, uh, according to the uh, user's input, right? So atomic functions for the actual activity, master functions for the business logic. That's how you get good extensibility and good usability. Fully verified commandlet names were warranted by the underlying technology. The Ember and Hyper-V is uh, the best example that I can think of. Both have get VM. So, whichever got loaded first. <laughs> Usefully qualified where you expect overlap. Dynamic parameters, again, to protect the users from making mistakes in calling your tool as it grows in functionality protocols and targets. And uh, state preservation, again, Hyper-V and VMware, a very good example. With Hyper-V, you just shoot the commandlets against the Hyper-V host to achieve things. With uh, VMware or SQL, for instance, you, you have to establish a connection and then you reuse that connection. So, uh, you might uh, want to have a way to transport the state across, uh, across the uh, separate functions in your module. Last thing, <clears throat> error handling. Of course, we should have error handling in our tools. We all know that and try catch and all that stuff. But <clears throat> usually you will not get meaningful feedback from the field about the, uh, the, the, the errors that you've caught about the errors that you think about that they may happen. But what you should insist on getting, uh, 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 getting back is information that you did not think of something and it still failed. And for that, you need to provide some feedback mechanism for handling unhandled, ex or for, for communicating unhandled ex uh, exceptions. And this is, where uh, the trap statement comes, in, comes into play, the tra trap statement in PowerShell is not very useful. But it is useful for this one thing. Provide a global quick breakout to um, unhandled extension, uh, exceptions, uh, I'm sorry, and provide like a trouble ticket. I have an example here. I will upload the files into uh, GitHub after the presentation. So this is, uh, this is how it works. I have, uh, I have a trap statement at the beginning of the script, and this trap statement actually only does three things. It creates, it creates a red alert object with the information I might need for, for my troubleshooting. It exports that that object is a JSON file. And it cleans up the error action preference and exits with an error code. So that even 
other systems calling this script know that it hasn't worked uh, uh, out very well. It works slightly different, differently in modules. I will provide this code as well. You can look at how to, how to do that in modules, but it's also possible. This is, of course, only valuable uh, if the users end up sending you that file. But you should put some meaningful error message in there asking the user to send you that file and telling them where to find it, by the way. So uh, I'll skip through this. Split the functionality, split the function out. This is a good one. Split the functionality out into separate files. This will come in very handy when you get collaborators, when you get several people working on your project and if you uh, end up reusing your functions. So, we are at the top, but I will give you the 10 questions to ask yourself before you start developing your next tool, which is probably today. Am I prepared to uh, assume responsibility for yet another tool? Who are the target audience? Will they give feedback? How will they use my thing? What technical knowledge uh, do they have? How do I know they really want that? This is a tough one, especially if uh, your tools is intended for uh, audiences outside of your organization. Where's the red line? Where, where do I stop at blowing my tool up? Where is it time to start a new project? What are the most important use cases? Because those should take the least parameters and have the least hurdle to uh, executing them uh, by the audience. What is the expected user experience? Input, output, and so on. What are the dependencies today? What sort of dependencies do I expect to, to have tomorrow? How will I inform my user base of new releases? This is an important one. How to prioritize feature requests? Talk to your devs if you have uh, any in your organization, they know. But their answers might not be what you seek. And what happens if I can't maintain that anymore? And this is, this is one question that you should be asking yourself when embarking on a new pro a project, because <clears throat> these things happen. People get sick, people leave the workplace, document early, make the documentation available to your team, make the documentation available to the community, and use consistent development and build processes. There are several sessions here at the summit this year on how to do that. Thank you very much. Please rate this session. Keep in mind that if you give it a good rating, you might end up seeing me here next year.